Catalyzing Change Week. This year's Catalyzing Change Week is about solutions from the front lines by social innovators. In 2022, Catalyst 2030 concentrated its efforts on bringing proximate leaders and frontline solutions to the forefront. Collaborations led by members from the Global South produced groundbreaking reports on climate and transforming education with an emphasis on offering local solutions. We continued our mission to create an enabling environment for social entrepreneurs to flourish by initiating a letter to donors signed by more than 1,200 social entrepreneurs and innovators. The Catalyst 2030 award ceremony was spectacular and the awards themselves welcomed by the private sector, governments, buyer multilaterals and donors. Catalyst 2030 as a movement is disruptive. One of the best things I think that's come out of Catalyst 2030 so far um, is incredible collaboration across the ecosystem that just didn't exist before Catalyst came into being. The thing I love most about Catalyst is that it's an open movement for social entrepreneurs around the world. I'd encourage anyone who's uh, looking to be more connected with their local communities around social development goals to come along to Catalyze and Change Week. Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. Welcome, welcome everyone. <clears throat> so nice uh, to see you all. So excited on this Thursday afternoon in Jordan and or wherever you are in the world, uh, tuning in, whether it's late in the evening or early in the morning, we're glad you're with us. Um, this is, um, uh, these are some housekeeping issues. Hopefully uh, you, by now you know all about them uh, and hopefully you've been attending multiple uh, Catalyzing Change Week events. And this is just another one of those. Um, so today, this session is about social justice index. Now, this is a concept that we came up with, uh, maybe oh, now it's almost two years ago. And it came out of a, a need uh, and um, a perception and uh, an observation of lack of fairness and social justice in many countries around the world. Uh, so the outline of this session is going to be a conversation. Uh, between me and Tariq Ulaymi, who is going to join us a little bit later because he had an emergency meeting with a minister in his country, Bahrain, which we will not, of course, um, <clears throat> take him out of that, but hopefully he'll join us soon. Uh, and a conversation with, with you, with the audience, with the participants, because we need your input. Uh, and that's why we please feel free to raise your hand uh, and, and just uh, speak out, critique, comp, uh, comment, ask a question. And also, um, uh, you could type in the chat as well. Uh, we're, we're conducting it in English, uh, although we're from Mina, Jordan region, but any language is welcome. <clears throat> if anyone has a language, something in Arabic they want to speak about, that's fine. Uh, but most importantly, this is not an information session. This is an engagement, interactive session. We want to hear you, uh, and we want to see, uh, hear your opinions and your advice. We need your advice. So uh, I will start by first introducing myself. Uh, my name is Rana Dejani. I'm a professor of molecular biology at the Hashemite University in Jordan. I work on the genetics of uh, <clears throat> in ethnic populations, and I work on epigenetics of trauma, meaning how does trauma impact our DNA and whether we transmit it across generations or not. That's my day job. My other job, I'm a social entrepreneur. Uh, and what is the meaning of that? That's a whole nother discussion. Uh, for those who were with us yesterday, we went into multiple definitions of social entrepreneurs with different cultural contexts. And please stay tuned with us uh, this evening 
in a few hours, we have another session about um, uh, understanding social entrepreneurship from a cultural lens with a very important panelist from Al Sharq Foundation uh, who work on um, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship and uh, across the, the Eastern part of the world. And hence their name, Al Sharq, which means East. Um, and I, as a result of that, I'm the founder of a program called We Love Reading, which is about changing mindsets through reading to create or nurture change makers. We're very careful the words that we use. Uh, and I'm also a very proud member, a board member of Catalyst 2030. And for those who don't know what Catalyst 2030 is, which is, of course, the host of this fantastic week and of this session, and what has allowed us to explore these crazy ideas, uh, Catalyst 2030 is a network of social entrepreneurs across the globe. Uh, and it's the true network, international network. You know, a lot of times they talk about international. It has a few people from Canada and it's all based in the U.S. No, this is a truly international um, uh, network led uh, with, uh, with diversity and inclusivity across the board. And that's why it's an honor to work with them and be them. Uh, but that's another conversation. We urge you to uh, learn more about Catalyst 2030 and join the movement. Um, so that's enough about me. Our second speaker uh, who will join us, as I said later, is Tariq Ulaymi, who is another social entrepreneur, a global shaper uh, from Bahrain. Uh, and he, he, uh, his Bahrain won the, uh, the Catalyst Award last year for innovation uh, in working with government because the government implemented um, a, a whole plan for uh, working with the local community and civic society to accelerate achieving the sustainable development goals. And this is the whole concept behind this, is how do we achieve the sustainable development goals, all 17 in time, if possible. But even if we do, there'll be plenty of other goals that need to be done. So our work will never stop. So uh, back to uh, the concept uh, behind this, this talk. So I'll uh, I wanna give a few, a little bit of a history. I'm a storyteller. It's been, uh, I'm fa famous for being a storyteller <laughs> and I believe in stories. Uh, and as a biologist, I think uh, throughout our evolution, we evolved to be storytellers. Like at some point in time, I envisioned there were two groups of people. There was a group of people who sat around the fire and told stories. And there was another group that looked at those telling stories and said, huh, you're wasting your time. But you can guess which group actually survived. It was the storytellers because you survive by learning through stories. Nobody wants to learn by somebody telling them do this and don't do that. They just, you know, they, they, they uh, all the barriers come up and you, you don't hear it but through storytelling, you learn a lot. And actually in Arabic, we have a very nice saying, which says, uh, I'll say it in Arabic and then translate. I tell the neighbor what I want, uh, but uh, indirectly, I want my daughter-in-law to, to listen, right? <laughs> so that's the mother-in-law speaking. <clears throat> so we learn indirectly. Uh, and that's a, a shout out to how we should change education as well. But that's another talk, which will be happening in less than an hour about how do we transform education from the bottom up using storytelling and, and social entrepreneurs from the ground and at the front lines. So the, the story of the social justice index uh, actually happened in May. It started in May 2020, May 2020, actually May 2021. Uh, so this was at the tail end of the pandemic. Uh, I mean, we're still, we're almost, well, we're, we're progressing out of the pandemic, but people were at least out of lockdown in May 21. And unfor and I had joined Catalyst 2030 a year before. So just to give you, it's all connected. Catalyst 2030 started in uh, December 2019 at the eve of COVID. And then I joined around February or March. And it was a fantastic thing, place to be, to work with others like-minded to make a difference in the world. Um, so a year afterwards in May, actually the end of May, so actually this is like an anniversary um, from 2021. Uh, well, I'm, I'm half Palestinian uh, from, and my father's from Jerusalem uh, and I'm half Syrian, my father, mother's from Aleppo, but let's focus on the paternal part. So uh, my father and my family, Dajani, has been living in Jerusalem for over 500 years. We have our own cemeteries, we have our homes uh, in West Jerusalem. <laughs> Um, however, in 1948, uh, when Zionist movements, the British left, and we can <laughs> blame a lot on the British, when they, they, they colonized Palestine, they moved out, and they left an open door for Zionist forces to take over uh, what is today uh, Israel, it's Palestine, my home country, and then the rest of the West Bank. So my father was five, and he and his family flee, they le left their homes, um, and went to Lebanon, thinking they're going to come back in two weeks, and they haven't since. And they're not alone. There was over 700,000 people. We call this the Nakba, 
uh, uh, which means the catastrophe, and actually was acknowledged by the UN last December as a, as a formal uh, event that happened that should be acknowledged. Um, and, and so uh, fast forward since 1948, it was 2021, and suddenly there were these atrocities happening in West Jerusalem, in, in my home town, where people were being evicted from their homes. They've been evicted all the time, but this was an, another uh, round of evictions um, and displacing people from their homes. And it got a, a lot of attention. I, I don't know if you were familiar, it was Sheikh Jarrah, the neighborhood. It got attention in the New York Times and about the atrocities, the oppression, the unfairness, the apartheid state. So I, I participate, and, and I'm telling this story because hopefully it'll inspire others. I'm imagining who are people in the audience or later will listen to this recording. Like what is our duty as human beings on this earth, right? Um, what can we do to remove oppression, to remove unfairness? And it's all around us. Uh, whether I mean, I have goosebumps when I think, I mean, we live our lives, we eat and drink and have fun, but ultimately there are an, a lot of oppression, unfairness around us in the world. And it's not just uh, in one country or one place or one community or one society, it's everywhere. It's how much we choose to see it and how much we choose to carry on with our lives and not pay attention or say, ah, oh, what can I do and just let give up? So it was at that point, uh, I go to multiple meetings and networks, and I thought, I, I need to share what's happening with me so that I can um, share in that burden. And this is back about mental health and well-being and sharing so people can help you deal with that trauma. But I mean, and I feel humble to say I have a trauma when I'm outside the country and I'm living and I'm, I feel safe when others don't feel safe. When the children cry every night because and they wet their beds because they're afraid that they somebody in the middle of the night will take them out of their bed to search their home uh, and they stay outside in the cold. Uh, so so what, what can we do? And being part of Catalyst 2030, with all the, the wonderful spirit of making a difference, uh, helping each other, I thought, this is the place where I can uh, 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 gather support to work on uh, reducing oppression and to play my part, right? I know I can't change the world. I, I don't think I can change what's happening in Palestine, but at least I can try. And I draw that from my own culture and religion, which says everyone is a guardian and we need to try and that do not belittle any good deed. So I, I just have to do something. So uh, in the tradition of Catalyst, somebody comes up with an idea and people create a working group and you share it with the secretariat, you share it with Jiru Belomori, for those who don't know, is the founder of the Catalyst 2030. Now, I'm a scientist, right? So I started not just for Catalyst, I started approaching many groups talking about, I want to do something about the social injustice. Well. As you, I'm sure you all you can all imagine, many groups were shied away because this is this has repercussions, um, and we we hear in the news a lot about the the, the hypocrisy and the double sidedness. So a lot of networks who claim to be neutral, who claim to support social justice, who claim to support humanity, backed out or did not respond. But Catalyst 2030 did responded, and Juru said, "Rana, if you want to do something, you go do it. You don't even have to ask permission. You don't even have to tell me about it." Just go find the support you want and do it. But she said one thing. She said, make sure you're making a difference, that you're not repeating something that others have done. Make sure you have added value. And that was wonderful advice because it, it, gave, it gave focus on, okay, so what is it that I want to do? And, and we have to do it smartly, right? It's innovation. It's about being smart and not just repeating the same thing or just crying or, or being emotional. It's about being strategic. And so uh, I started thinking about what, what can we do? And of course, I met with a wonderful people group, Deepa, who is with us today, uh, others who were part of uh, uh, Catalyst 2030 at that time. Uh, I want to mention Anthony, who's since gone, and Ryan, who have since gone, uh, who were interns, who were helping out in Catalyst 2030, and Tariq, who will join us soon. Tariq was with me in this, was very uh, invested, and said, we have to do something. So we, we started thinking, what is it that we want to do? Because it's not about Palestine. What we realized, it's everywhere. And it's not just like in developed country, in developing countries who are, who are exposed to colonization and, and, or dictatorships. It's even in developed countries. Jason, we called in Jason Jacobs, who's also with us today, talking about the indigenous groups and the atrocities and the, and the injustices that happened in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, uh, and other places around the world. That we even taught the United States which in our part of the world, the global South, it's, called, it's looked at as developed the epitome of, of um, advancement. 
But we know what happened with Black Lives Matter. We know what happened in 2020. And we, we know that there are two worlds in America. So that, that's there as well. So it's everywhere. So what, and that's the important thing. We don't want to do just something for one particular part of the world. We want to help humanity as a whole. We have to start somewhere. But then we learn with every iteration, with every country, with every group, we learn and we build on that learning and we go forward. And it's an evolution in a way, right? From biology, we, have, we evolve, we learn. We're not going to get it right the first time. <laughs> That's why we need everyone to help us and advise us. And so the thing was, okay, so we have, a, a, this is not something um, unique to a particular part, but we're going to start with Palestine because it was in our face. It was happening at the time. And actually, you know, I mean, uh, other atrocities are ongoing, but they've been a long time happening. This is like really fresh, <laughs> a colonizing settler mentality happening in the 21st century when people thought that that's from the past, that's gone, nobody's going to do it anymore. It's still happening and it's being supported. That's what's scary in the name of democracy, in the name of modernity, in the name of advancement and progress. So we said, okay, so what do we do? We, we did our homework. We looked around what, what approaches have different groups of people done to, to highlight these atrocities, to fight that unfairness. And a lot of it is media. A lot of it is, of course, on the ground happening today in Palestine, and that's a very important role. But we, the people outside, what can we do that's different? And that's when we, the idea was, why don't we use um, the approach of the sustainable development goals, right? Everybody wants to work on sustainable development goals. Every country, every nation has, is, being account, is being held accountable for that. Um, so we have a tool that's neutral, that nobody can say, why are you working on this, uh, to use as an approach. And we actually learned from how the oil companies, because you learn from examples, right? Other similar situations. The oil companies um, that were against climate change and denied all the evidence and, and did all the, uh, the, the, the hypocrisy, uh, the buying out of clients, uh, the, the, in, in Arabic, we call it um, the, the, the corruption, right? Uh, and so we said, how, how were, were the people who defended climate change able to convince governments that the oil companies are wrong? They used that strategic approach of economic uh, boycotting, of uh, using research and evidence, but they did it indirectly by showing the reality on the ground. So we thought, why don't we use that kind of approach? Why don't we use showing, and we're talking about now the example of Palestine, that Israel, on all the indices, indices of happiness, they're number seven. Indices of democracy, they're pretty high. I don't remember the number. Indices of well-being, health, whatever, they're always very high. And it's like, wait a minute, but right, what's happening inside Israel in 1948 are, is, a, is a real appetite. So how, what, what is this index? What does it mean? And so we thought, why don't we use that? We want to create an index to showcase the sustainable development goals and use that social justice lens to showcase that in, a, in this specific index that Israel does not rate that high, that there are reasons that it, it is rating low. And those reasons will lead us to, as you dig to find those reasons, and you're very, um, the whole approach is for sustainable development goals, right? We're not talking about anything else, but as we uncover why we're not achieving the sustainable development goals, we realize it's because there are injustices happening around us. So it's, a, it's an indirect way and the reason we want to do it is so we can gain support from other groups who may shy away from being politi political and so on. And we're saying, no, this is just about sustainable development goals. We all want to change it. And the reason we, we use the social justice index to highlight the sustainable development goals and not just sustainable development goals by themselves is you could go into Palestine and you could see that there's not enough water. And initially, if you don't know the, the, the context, you'd think, oh, the people don't know how to handle the water. They don't know how to um, um, conserve. Uh, they don't have school curricula to tell them what to do. They don't have laws. But actually, that's not the barrier. That, that's a barrier in other countries to not achieve the sustainable development goals. Or if we're talking about education or poverty, whatever. Those are barriers that happen in a, a country where people are treated more or less fairly. But in an apartheid state, the reason you can't have equal water distribution or equal or uh, remove poverty or have equal education is because there's a military uh, person standing at the door of your school, uh, allow, uh, making children wait for hours before they can go to school or come back. Even at the university, people can't go into the university. A woman will deliver in the middle of the street because of the, of the checkpoints. That's the reason we can't achieve the sustainable development goals. And to highlight those, we need a social justice index that could highlight that. So that's the kind of the story of how we got to wanting to create a social justice index. 
now to do to do the homework we uh, we 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 researched all the other indices around right because i'm a scientist we're all we need to do our homework first and we we made a whole collection of all these indices and a table and compared all the different indices and why what, what was lacking in that landscape of indices so that we can formulate this index that would fill that gap and we called it the social justice index um, and on the way, we met a lot of people, a lot of uh, organizations that work in this field, and everybody was interested to be part of this because we, we kind of presented it in a way uh, that is um, easy, neutral, and familiar. Again, being smart, like the example I told you about talking to my neighbor so my daughter-in-law can, li can listen. Um, and so uh, we, we came up with a kind of an outline of what the social justice index should look like. We created a task force with multiple stakeholders, um, some uh, very uh, local meaning part of Palestine and some more uh, uh, global. And the idea is to have an advisory um, um, part of the task force to advise us as we go for, uh, forward from other people like uh, Jason from New Zealand to help us or somebody from Canada like uh, Eva, who's another Catalyst member who, who is a lawyer and works on ethics and other people in Canada and so on. So that's the idea as we progress. However, you know, time, it takes time and we all do this in a, in a volunteer basis, but we very, we very much care uh, and we want to, uh, we want to make this happen, but we want to do it right. So we're not in a hurry. I mean, it is a very urgent issue, but I mean, we're not in a hurry because we want to do it right. And we want to make sure that we don't miss on this opportunity. Um, so last year in Catalyzing Change Week, we presented, uh, we had a panel. Uh, of people concerned about social justice. And we had a very nice discussion. I urge you to check it out. It's on YouTube, uh, recorded from last year. This year, we didn't make a big panel because we just want to touch base with people. We wanted guidance from our audience and we wanted to invite people to reinvigorate them uh, to continue because unfortunately the atrocities have, uh, if I was bothered in May, it's like a hundredfold today because of the change in, um, in, uh, in, in, the, in the governance of, of Israel. Uh, so, so I'm going to stop here. And I'd love to open uh, the floor for people who would like to ask questions. Uh, I'll try to answer if I have the answer or to comment or to give us advice uh, uh, or, uh, you know, advice on who to uh, ask us to, has to join with us, to partner or critique us. Tell us, Rana, this is, this is not going to work. This is crazy. But give me an alternative, right? If you're going to critique me, just give us advice on what to do uh, uh, otherwise. So floor is yours. No questions. Well, maybe I'll I'll throw something out to everyone. So uh, I mean, I talk about this. I have a question. Oh yeah, I have please a go question, Doctor Rena. Yes. Uh, so, what was the main challenge you faced uh, when you started this social index, working on social index? Ah, oh. uh, good. Uh, okay, uh, good question, Marwa. Um, uh, well, the main challenge was first of all. Uh, I think two, and I mentioned them briefly, is about finding somebody who would uh, work with us to support us and, and encourage us to keep going. Like I said, uh, many networks shied away. They said, we don't want to be involved in this. And actually, we, we even tried. We, uh, I interviewed uh, uh, five uh, Palestinian scientists, female scientists, to, and wrote about their experiences, uh, how they were hindered in doing science at the universities because of the apartheid. Uh, nobody would publish them. These were really very good interviews. Uh, and we sent them to many places, whether the New York Times, Atlantic, and General Public, or even science, Nature and Science. Finally, we were able to just um, publish a commentary with a link to a blog for all the interviews. So that's one challenge. Um, and the other challenge is really figuring it out, right? What is the social justice index? And again, finding those experts. I'm not an expert in this, right? I just care. And, and I believe that uh, caring is not enough. We need to bring in the experts. And I, it's a, finding those experts who have the time and commitment uh, to really push it forward. And again, that's another challenge. That's why we're being slow in doing it, but hopefully it's, it's, it'll happen. Everything takes its time. It's like cooking. It has to stew. Uh, Jason, you had, a, you had a question? Yeah, I was just going to add to um, of the young lady you asked about uh, what was the challenges I do remember that day quite clearly because obviously one of our um, um, and people had, had been taken and gone. And I, I do remember being in the room. And of course, I knew that yourself and others knew this um, particular person quite well. 
And so um, what it did highlight to me was that how, um, how it can ruffle people who um, are very um, sure about what they want to do in life and how they want to give love to people and do all these things. I remember the whole room being very dark for a moment and then we were able to bring clarity because then we started all galvanizing around each other. So um, in answer to your question to the young lady, is it Fatwa or is that? Uh, marua, Marua. She's, I, yeah, so it was, it was that there was, it's um, that emotional state can take you, but when you can allow that to be, to pass over you. And so um, in a way I wanted to, I just wanted to just open it up just a little bit in my way, how we would do it. And then we would get on with the day because it allows us to really um, galvanize in it. So I'll just say a few words and then I'll translate it. So, anamehi o te rā, ki te whānau e hui nei. Kia tau te rangamaria, kia whakatau pua, tātou me nā mea, e whakapono ana tātou, homi e, hui e, taiki e. Greetings of the day to the family gathered here. Let peace be with us, and may we respect each other and what we believe, draw together, 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 united as one. Um, so I just thought that would be that's a good starting point from our my perspective of coming from there, Rana, to allow us to galvanize because when we talk about these issues, whether they are fundamentally important for our people in in the Middle East or in other places, opening up the the light and the dark, uh, and no matter which which faith we are, when we open that up, we cannot guarantee what comes into the room. So I say that blessing for the protection of the ones who are in the room to protect them. And then when we leave, they can go safely back to their everyday opportunity, uh, to their everyday things. So now coming back to the social uh, index, uh, the social justice index, um, we wanted to ask our, our, our people here today, um, it's wonderful that you're here and that you're present because obviously there are, I, I'm going to just put it out there and, you know, there's our operational things which can affect everybody every day. Then there's the cultural things that can affect you every day. Then there's our spiritual things. And what we're doing here is allowing us to cross over all three, but then we harness it so we can understand whenever we're addressing a particular group of people that are not so... Um, that are not so um, helpful or are trying to um, disseminate us in a way that we are not feeling comfortable about being a woman, about giving you know opportunities to our communities, all these things. I think it's important to understand this operational, cultural, and spiritual. And then when we talk about it, it's okay to move across between any of those three realms in terms of social um, index that we can build together so that's enough for me it was just to say um you know there will be things that will none of us want to hear but it's important as rana dr rana illustrated to put down and to discuss it because we know with communication and a bit of balance and a bit of focus and a, and a few bits of facts and knowledge we can find a balance in what we want to address so um i'll open it up to the floor and um, yeah I just look forward to us you know coming up with what we feel is a good balance or harmony for for us going forward thank you thank you Jason for sharing uh, whenever I uh, spend time with you uh, I feel grounded you you thank you uh, I I don't have enough words to to <laughs> express those feelings thank you very much we, we there's so much to learn from each other uh, for, thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. Who who would like to comment and respond? Yes, please, uh, uh, Mehdi. Yes, um, thank you very much for sharing your story. Indeed, you are a great storyteller. Um, I think we all enjoyed hearing you. Uh, but I, I have a question for you. You talked about the resistance you faced, uh, notably from the Israeli side and uh, for organizations or media that are... Um, on that side, but I know that there are in Israel uh, many uh, organizations 
uh, that care about uh, the West Bank people, about the Palestinians, and who advocate for more rights for these communities. For example, um, I think about uh, Rabis for Human Rights, or Bet Salam, or Gisha. I don't know if you know them. And my question is, have you tried to get in contact with them or representatives or someone to you know, have support from inside Israel and maybe they could um, be that voice, uh, you're not the voice because you are the voice obviously, but be uh, some kind of, just uh, take her voice and, and take it somewhere else. You know, I don't know if my question is, um, is clear, but have you tried to get in contact with them? Thank you. Yes, yes. No, your question is very relevant. And yes, of course, we wanted we uh, part of the strategy is uh, talking to all stakeholders and ab absolutely to reaching out to uh, p uh, to people in Israel, uh, Jewish people in Israel to help us to work with us. And there are plenty and they are amazing. Uh, actually, in the first meeting we had, uh, we invited the representatives from Jewish Voice for Peace and we had their head there and she was amazing. Uh, she sh she shared and she spoke and and she was ready to support in every way possible. Uh, so yes, we did. We reached out to them, uh, and and we and you know they they are a network of themselves, so they would know better who who is who can support us, who can come with us on this journey, who is sincere. Uh, and that's about talking with experts, right? So I, I'm not just going to reach out to anyone. I went to the ones I really know because they're track, they have a track record of what they do and how they support. Uh, and they are helping us. It's Jewish, Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, uh, so that's one. And if you know of others, please reach out to us and, and send, uh, send us. Because like I said, this is the prototype. And then we're going to reiterate for other parts around the world once we produce this uh, index that can be used for everyone. And uh, we have with us Tariq. Thank you very much, Tariq, for joining. I hope your minister's meeting went well. We told everybody you had a minister meeting. That's why you couldn't come. Um, but um, if we'd like to, to introduce yourself uh, first, and then if you want to share, I told the whole story of the social justice index, of, uh, of how it happened and where we are today. And the rest of the, uh, the this time is we're interacting with the audience, people here, trying to figure out what is the next step? What do, what do we want to do? And how can we overcome these barriers? But over to you, if you want to share, uh, uh, you are much elo more eloquent than me uh, about your uh, approach, why you cared about this, and where do you think we should go? Over to you, Tariq. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. And again, my apologies for not being able to be here for the first half of just now that you shared. I probably don't need to say anything because uh, everything has already been communicated that I think is. Um, is important. Um, but I, I I can maybe just touch upon, um, assuming what you would have shared, maybe just my own view indeed is why I think this is important work, not just for Catalyst, um, I think members, but for the wider uh, Catalyst community um, to kind of briefly introduce myself and why I do care deeply about Catalyst. I'm a, one of the, uh, the co-chairs of the Bahrain chapter, I'm also a social entrepreneur myself uh, and a social entrepreneur who struggles, I think, with this topic, as many of you, when we are working with funders, with states, um, and with development organizations. Um, and it's particularly a struggle when we are looking at complex and intersecting justices um, at, I think, country-level frameworks, where we see many different state and non-state-sponsored uh, social injustice, but in our contracts in HR, in systems methods, in funders, um, and how data is distributed, um, none of these considerations are being brought into play. Um, and I think what I can add and what I've been thinking about is, you know, what are potential dimensions of a social justice index? Um, and I think in our many conversations, we've had different uh, views on what that can and maybe should be. Um, and I can share kind of briefly my own, um, of course, in the topic of annexation um, that, that we know and that I kind of entered into the conversation with, um, and of course of apartheid, uh, those are two uh, key drivers of state-sponsored state social injustice that are not usually considered in uh, development metrics and frameworks, um, but it's also many others that are connected, including you know, the debt climate nexus, the UN is currently in thinking around what does a multi-dimensional vulnerability index look like for small islands uh, because they face structural challenges of taking on more debt uh, as they're faced by the climate crisis, yet they're not responsible for it. And funding doesn't go and flow uh, simply because we're still using a gross 
national income as a basis for deciding where funding goes uh, in, in terms of climate, um, climate portfolio funding. There's, of course, land dispossession, um, legal and non-legal means of removal of persons. There's the, the loss of traditional knowledges and practices uh, and the intentional eraser of indigenous identity and cultures by the state and non-state actors. Um, there's another dimension on authorization where uh, we see injustices uh, or practices of injustices made possible by laws uh, and backed by a state authority. Um, another dimension that I see is modern day slavery, um, which is a severe exploitation of other people for personal and professional gain. And of course, you have the modern day slavery index, uh, which look at that as a as a whole. Um, and uh, for our colleagues uh, in, in North America, particularly brought up, you know, states of incarceration, the systemically disproportionate you know, racial ethnic states of incarceration of judicial uh, protection. Uh, where the state upholds uh, constitutionally injustices. Um, and from our climate colleagues that we've engaged uh, are bringing up you know, environmental injustice, you know, state-driven uh, ecological injustices uh, that violate the international law, um, as well as the United Nations Convention on Genocide. Um, and then from our uh, social justice and client colleagues, uh, of course, corruption and cooptation, where the use of powers by government and officials uh, gain uh, contracts for illegitimate, illegitimate, illegitimate private gain. Um, and I think finally appropriation, which is I think, my entry point into this, uh, where we see unequal net appropriation of global South countries by the global North. Um, and today we can kind of track that rich countries rely on net appropriation of resources of $10 trillion per year from poorer countries. And even if I look at kind of those example dimensions, none of that is really considered within how I think I have been able to interact with funders, donors, states, the UN, and how we're tracking uh, injustice, how we're assessing the complexity of these issues. Um, and I think why I'm very excited with, um, I think by the social justice index, because there's many, I think, potential different entry points that are overlapping and interconnecting. And maybe I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. You, you, uh, thank you very much. You've kind of you've given us the broader global picture of why this is important and why everybody should care and everybody should be part of this working group uh, and should join forces with us to make a difference wherever we are in the world. If if we really care about humanity going forward, because we're all connected, right? Um, if one part of the world there's an injustice, everyone else is going to pay the price uh, at some point in the future. Thank you, thank you, Tariq, very much. Uh, um, I'm going to, uh, does anyone have any comment or would like to add to what Tariq said uh, or have an insight because he gave us all the broad examples that kind of all relate. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, so yesterday was the international day for uh, the freedom of journalism. And I want to ask how uh, uh, freedom of journalism is related to social index and how we can measure it in countries like in, in Palestine, we have uh, a clear conflict, but like in countries like Jordan or other countries, we don't have that clear uh, conflict. However, we still need a better social justice. So how uh, they are related? Uh, Tariq, could you, uh, I, over to you. Uh, thank you. That's a, it's an excellent question. I'll maybe bring up um, Marwa, what some of what has been discussed in our previous meetings, which is, in some cases, there are existing indices, um, such as the, the World Press Freedom Index uh, and the, the Freedom Index at large. And what some members had highlighted is, actually, when you look at those kinds of indices, um, one, they're defic deficit indices, so they structure countries hierarchically on what's best and what's worst. Uh, but often what's best is a global, quite a global North view of, of what's best based on a particular form of democracy, a particular form of what is understood by freedom, um, not also considering in some cases where states may appear free uh, internally, uh, yet fund, uh, projects and press and disinformation um, in other countries uh, to the detriment of local populations. And part of what has come up in, in this process is how do we think of an index in a way that's not 
hierarchical in that in that way that we're repeating that mistake. But when it comes to uh, uh, aspects such as press freedom and freedoms at large, how is it rooted in a local definition of what freedom is, uh, and not also imposed by um, uh, by you know, global north governments or countries, which actually influence very much uh, these kind of global indices in a way which um, uh, Palestine or others may seem worse off than than, than what they are, not considering the the wider systemic injustices that the uh, press is subject to um, in such countries. Um, and yeah, that's kind of just I think a little bit of what has come up in our in our meetings and um, a need that that I think you you've highlighted very pertinently. Um, and Rana, I don't know if you'd like to also add on onto that. No, no, you brought, I mean, Marwa, great question. And Tariq, you brought up very important points, which actually leads, we're coming to you, Nauras, we want to hear your question, but which leads me to uh, another very important point that we looked at is the, the tools we use to measure. How are they designed? How are they constructed? Uh, how the question is posed? And how can we unpack it, decolonize it, uh, uh, to make sure that we are taking into consideration the local? This is very important. And, and one thing that really kept coming up is storytelling. How do we capture the essence and not just the statistical number because that may not really reflect what's happening on the ground. So again, we're also through this challenging um, how we measure uh, we measure impact, how we measure what's on the ground, which is a very important issue, not just for social justice, but for, for all kinds of innovation, uh, uh, different ways or innovative ways of measuring. Uh, so, so they're all related in a way. Uh, and, uh, and maybe one thing to add about if we don't understand what's happening locally, the world will suffer going forward. I mean, the global north can only go for a little bit further. And then eventually everything is going to um, suffer. Uh, so I think that's important. And maybe one last point to highlight, this is not just about um, um, a particular kind of oppression or injustice, it's everything. Uh, you, you mentioned examples, Tariq. I want to add more examples about women and gender. Uh, in a lot of indices, um, many countries in the Arab world rate very low, yet we have we, there's a very, in many places a lot of respect for women that doesn't come out on the index um and so it, not that to say that one country is better than the other again that hierarchy is very dangerous it's about that we are complicated cultures we're complicated humans it's not black and white it's about understanding that complexity unpacking it and navigating the nuances so that we can really uh come up with solutions and interventions that are local to really address the local challenges uh, and therefore create a better life for people. So they're all, it's all connected, but, and hopefully the social justice index will be a, um, a pivotal point, somewhere to start for everybody. Notice, please. Yeah, we can't hear you. While we're waiting for that, I'd just like to add um, something in relation to when she comes back in, or oh, she's back. Uh, we still can't hear you. Try to go in and out, yeah. Yes, Jason. Yeah, I just wanted to add in terms of the um, what I did, what I've done this last year is actually been testing the media in terms of what it can actually be filtered or profiled by people if they wanted to read it. So being a former golf caddy, um, I have about 40, 50 um, nationalities. So then you can send a piece of information to different people in different countries. And it's quite, it's very interesting where I'm just might be sending something about some music star and people can't read it. And then I start to take note of, excuse me, why can't you read it? Oh no, we can't see it at all. What is it? You know? And then I started realizing that in different locations and in different places, media or particular things are filtered. So even the local can't read it or can't access it. And so then we started looking at, okay, what if I give it to you in Telegram? Or what if I give it to you in Signal? And we started testing these sorts of things to then make sure the message can go through. Now, of course, it's not the level that I want us to take this, but it was interesting why I felt my universe opening me up to understanding what can be put down as knowledge and what can be held back. And so that was something I wanted to say to Mawa in terms of the 
um, the journalist day, I was going to ask you, um, why have they suddenly made that a day? You know, I was wanted to ask you back, why has it been suddenly made a day when um, I would have thought a fundamental um, upholding of a journalism, journalist is to allow the knowledge to come through to the people. And then I do a simple test like this around 40 different countries. And, you know, um, Justin Bieber's got um, Paul's, Paul's palsy syndrome. And then I send it out and he can't, um, uh, 10 different countries can't read it. They say, oh, no, we can't access it. So it's not even threatening, but it's still blocked. So, yeah, but um, we'll pick that. Oh, sorry, Moa, you were going to say, you were muted, I think. You were going to say. Um, I'm gonna try. To, can you hear me now? Oh yes, yeah. just uh, yes. Thank you, thank you, Noras, for bringing back. Jason, we want to address your point, but we'll go to uh, Noras and then come back to you because there's a lot to talk about. That that that's a very important thing about getting the word out. Uh, yes, Noras, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for today's session. It's amazing. And but sorry, it's the first time I, I hear about this project. So w at which level are you now exactly? I'm, that picture is not clear with the oh. with the with the social justice index. Like wh where are you now? At which level? So we we've created a, a kind of a working group task force within Catalyst 2030. Um, there's a core, and then there's a you know bigger circles. Uh, we've uh, there, we have a concept we have a concept note. Uh, we have a whole folder uh, about the research that was done, comparing all the indices and the different uh, gaps in the indices, as uh, Tariq mentioned. Uh, so that's also available for, for anyone to look at. And we kind of proposed a, a pipeline or a strategic plan of how we would unroll it in phases uh, of what to do in terms of countries first, but then also in terms of what is the social justice index. And, um, and there was the discussion, it took time. Uh, should we create an index? Should we create a toolkit for companies and organizations to evaluate, to help their employees use it as a tool for, for uh, raising awareness to social justice? Uh, so there were different, because we are by the people, for the people, led by the members. There was um, you know, a big discussion of where should we start and how can we, what, can it, what is it unique that we can give? So we said there's a lot of toolkits out there that can be used or adapted, but what we found is really unique is the social justice index. That is, nobody's done this. This is really going to be an added value. And, and, and that's what I learned from the beginning. If you're gonna do this, make sure you, are, you have something new to say at the table that will benefit everyone in the end. And so at this point, we'd love you to join us. <laughs> we we okay. plan to meet every, like we were planning quarterly meetings and hopefully this will be a kickoff to encourage us to go back. Atarik is back from his sabbatical from his master's. So hopefully we can, you know, invigorate it again and start and we need everybody on board. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm currently doing my PhD in the University of Southampton in the UK. And I'll be in, I'm Palestinian. So I'm going back to Palestine the whole summer to start collecting data because I'm doing my my PhD research is about social entrepreneurship in Palestine uh, and the potential of social entrepreneurship. But it's in my research is all about decolonizing the 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 concept of social entrepreneurship within the Palestinian context. So it's about uh, understanding social entrepreneurship like the Palestinian understanding of social entrepreneurship and the real potential of it, what change can it really bring in reality, not only like um, at micro level, small businesses selling organic products or the, our, our issues are much deeper and much wider. And in the end, we're all social entrepreneurs as Palestinians, we have our identity and and our, our suffering, which guide us to be social entrepreneurs naturally. But what's happening is that social entrepreneurship because it's supported by uh, developed countries, it is coming to us like um, from a neoliberal understanding of the whole world uh, system. So this is what I'm trying to do with my research. I'd love to to join you uh, with this because I think I I, I might offer something and uh, I know all the most of the stakeholders also in Palestine but I, I want to ask you where can I find all those like documents about uh, the social justice index 
So we invite you to join Catalyst 2030 and become a member. <laughs> Please. I don't know if you are or not. I, I am. I, I am. You are. I oh, am. perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So just reach out to Lufran or me or Tariq and you, you can join, uh, ac access the, the content. And then uh, next time we have a meeting, we'd love to have you. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. And Nawaz, no, no, just to add to that, um, have you come across um, Russia, Abu Safia yet? In our catalyst group now she's um she's come out of palestine and she lives down in dunedin not far from me so i work with her quite a bit so if you want to get hold of her in terms of you know talking about these things you want to follow through in terms of um, social entrepreneurship and within palestine perfect what, what's her name again russia russia abu safia ah, um okay. and Thank so you. Um, she's actually originally from uh, gaza and uh, I have been actually trying to have her joining our Palestine chapter meeting, but she actually, because of the time difference, it becomes really hard. But we would love to have her as well joining. Yeah, she's a co-chair with me for Aotearoa Catalyst 2030. So, or New Zealand, New Zealand Catalyst 2030. But I just thought I'd put that in there while we are uh, carrying on with the bits and pieces. Um, and then, so, yeah, and then coming back to, so now... So we so then whatever message we want to put out there, um, Dr. Rana, it's important what we talked about in terms of the messaging and how we can connect to our communities. Because I noticed that if you put a word in front, so if you put um, dove or pretty pigeon in front of quite a nasty text, it would go through. Mm -hmm. But if you actually put, you know, nasty pigeon, then it would uh, most likely not make it through to the media or the media you wanted it to make it to. So I started sort of just, just maybe it was for this group, but I was just sort of interested in the knowledge, you know, and wondering, wow, it's just Justin Bieber with Bell's palsy. You know, if you don't know what Bell's palsy is, when you have a frozen face and it can be affected by your neurosystem and it can give you, so Justin Bieber got that. So I was just, we were putting that around. And there was certain countries that weren't able to access that information, you know. And then we tried to go through all the different streams and they couldn't get it still. And then we tried, okay, make it um, a pretty pigeon or a good pigeon or something like this. And then it made it through. So it was quite interesting, like how you could um, filter it through. Yeah, that's a science on its own. And it's becoming mm. very, very important for any cause. Uh, and then you have TikTok and you have everything, right? And and uh, and uh, with all the freedom of, of speech, but uh, TikTok is giving a lot of freedom of speech for people. And it goes both ways, good and bad. Uh, it depends on who defines what is good and bad. Back to Tariq's comment about who defi defi defines what. Uh, but these are important issues that should be part of this uh, and part of this journey. And again, we need to, uh, uh, part of the, I think the objective is to create a strategic plan to do th one thing at a time because there's so much to be done and if we attempt to do everything we will we won't be able to but if we focus then we can hopefully achieve one piece at a time and it's a it's going to be a lifelong journey uh but it's a good one uh especially for me i mean uh, the more the older i become i feel this is the, my calling uh deepa you were going to say something uh and then we will try to end because there uh, there's another session coming up right after this that i am chairing as well so deepa go ahead no we want to hear from you no, 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 it's okay. I had I had lots of thoughts and questions, um, but I will save them for another day. I'll let you close. I'll let you both close. Okay, but we want them. Please make sure <laughs> you connect with us. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, Tariq, do you want to share a few words? I will give my space to Deepa to give her closing remarks. God, yes, Deepa, go. Tariq, that was so smooth. Um, no, I just, I wanted to, I think, just the, the significance of this, um, I think from A, from where it came from, um, but this idea of state orchestrated roles within with within social injustice and the recognition of that, I think are really huge. And I think that, so I was gonna ask about indicators and like the process of co commonality of indicators, um, because we've covered journalism, um, women's rights, um, racial segregation, um, othering, um, and, you know, the list goes on, um, freedom of press. And 
the commonality and it may be that actually from that difference the commonality becomes the universality of the social injustice and the social justice and so where we can get maybe bogged down by trying to find those commonalities but actually maybe the diversity there's richness in acknowledging that diversity um and I just thought that like I'd be interested to think about the approaches to that process as 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 things evolve um and so that was going to be my kind of reflection to all of you but that, I I fully appreciate that that's a that's something quite big to ponder and to reflect on thank you that is the best ending because you left us with something to think about something to work with and not just go home feel good or or despair but to think okay i i i know what i have to think about this and find an answer and i love how you said the commonality is the universality of the social injustice which is inherent in the diversity and that reflects nature that's that's nature we're all different but we all share the same dna so how can we capture that Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating, for commenting. Uh, we hope to see you in our working group once we, next time we set a, a meeting. Thank you for Catalyst 2030, and, and we love reading for supporting this in, in happening. And hopefully, uh, slowly, we will participate and contribute to making this world a better place. Thank you very, very much. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Don't forget to go to the other Catalyzing Change Week uh, events and uh, 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 in peace. Assalamu alaikum.